All right. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Do you want to intro us, Ryan? Sorry. For sure. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll take a stab with that. Hi. So my name is Ryan White. I'm a director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And I'm with Mary Holt, Planetarium Program Specialist, who uh, will be our host for today's Cosmic Conversation. Normally, the third Thursday of every month, uh, I do a program called Universe Update, where I talk a little bit about news stories from the last year, uh, from last year, from last month, and uh, uh, and give a little bit of a tour of the universe while I do so. So it's kind of putting these astronomical stories in context. Uh, with the planetarium closed right now, we're kind of looking at different ways to do that. And since Fridays are normal cosmic conversation time, where we talk to experts on different astronomical topics, uh, we just decided we'd use this Fridays. Uh, to do a little bit of a tour of the universe with some of the most recent astronomy news. So uh, Mary and I will be talking about some of the cool stuff. And uh, meanwhile, I'll be flying uh, through the universe. And so most of the time, in fact, um, I'm experimenting with new cameras. So I think I appear a little squished right now. Sorry about that. Um, but, uh, but at least Mary looks normal. Um, and, uh, and most of the time, actually, you'll be looking at what you're seeing over on the right hand side of your screen, which is uh, this three dimensional virtual model of the universe. And we'll be kind of flying around and talking about it. So uh, with that, I guess we could get going. Yeah. And uh, if people do have any questions, uh, you can put them in the comment box and we can talk about those as well. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, I am piloting live. And occasionally, what you'll see, you'll actually see my. Uh, cursor in the form of the arrow that you're seeing superimposed here um, uh, near the International Space Station. In the interest of time, I'm kind of leaving the International Space Station behind. Hopefully you had a good look at it as we were uh, starting up the show. But that's as far as humans travel out into space these days. Uh, and uh, as we pull away, it looked like it was sort of plummeting into uh, uh, into the South American continent. But in fact, uh, we were just pulling away from our location in orbit around Earth. Uh, and this is always a nice reminder that there is no up in space because as we leave Earth behind, you'll see that South America is uh, kind of oriented differently than a typical map uh, hanging up in your um, grade school classroom, uh, which is sort of a nice reminder that there is no up in space. Uh, and here we've just passed the orbit of Earth's moon. So you can see uh, the moon here in the foreground and the orbit of the moon around Earth. And Ryan, was that uh, the ISS, uh, was that its position today? Yeah, I kind of cheated. So uh, the ISS, uh, when I put when I set things up this morning, uh, would have been in darkness. So I decided to make it a little more interesting. And, uh, uh, and uh, I actually backed up time a little bit uh, so that the, uh, the International Space Station would be in daylight. So I kind of cheated that, but it's the actual orbit of uh, ISS. And in fact, that's, that's a great reminder that all of what we're showing here uh, is driven by data. So we're actually looking at data, uh, the uh, three-dimensional model that's been built up uh, using astronomical data uh, acquired by astronomers and, and other researchers over a period of, of decades, really. It's also a good reminder of how uh, far away things are in space. So we left the International Space Station behind. It was only a few hundred kilometers above Earth. Uh, the orbit of the moon around Earth, that's as far as humans have ever traveled into space. Uh, and uh, and now we're pulling so far away that we're actually seeing uh, the sun and the orbits of the other planets around the sun. Mostly we're focused here on the inner solar system. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Those are what we call the terrestrial planets, the Earth-like planets. They're Planets that are kind of rocky, you can imagine uh, landing on them and walking around. Um, although, uh, definitely want to bring a spacesuit because uh, only Earth is a very comfortable place uh, to visit, even here in the inner solar system, relatively close to home. I actually want to take us over to Mars for a moment. Um, and uh, so I'm going to uh, let the computer navigate me toward Mars. How often do you talk about Mars in your universe updates? I feel like there's often a lot of news around Mars. In terms yeah, of you know, Mars gets a lot of attention. It is um, for a couple reasons. I mean, it's the uh, one of the closest planets. Venus is, is 
um, on average closer. Uh, but it's also this fascinating world. Again, it's kind of like Earth. I mean, we, you, 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 I've even given a presentation to to astro uh, non astronomers, to biologists, and, and uh, shown an image of Mars, and someone said, "Oh, it's not Mars. That looks like Earth," because some of the parts of Mars actually look like deserts on Earth. So it's really kind of a phenomenal place. Uh, and it's also a place that uh, it's a lot smaller than Earth. Uh, its gravity isn't enough to hold on to it. The thick atmosphere that we have around Earth. And at one point in the ancient past, Mars was um, very much more hospitable to life. We we know that water wants to put on that surface. And, and so we kind of go back to Mars a lot, with a lot of different spacecraft to monitor it from orbit uh, and to land on its surface to study what has happened uh, over the history of the billions of years of uh, Mars's history, uh, where water was probably one prevalent in the ancient past and, uh, and certainly not so common now. If water exists on Mars, we know there's some frozen to the ice cap, we know there's some frozen water under the surface, but if it exists in large quantities, it's almost certainly buried under the surface. So part of the reason we talk about a lot is that we spend a lot of money to send missions there. Uh, and the one that I wanted to mention today uh, is called the Curiosity Mission. And it's been uh, on Mars for quite a while, uh, still exploring what's called uh, Gale Crater Care. And actually, I think, since I uh, already revealed that, uh, oh, no, actually, Gale Crater is in sunlight. I wasn't sure if I might need to uh, fast forward time or create some artificial lighting for it to see. Uh, the Gale Crater is kind of here in the center of the image. Uh, and the Curiosity rover, we're actually going to its location uh, a couple of years ago, as a matter of fact, when we first created this. But um, uh, And as we get close to Mars, you'll notice it's kind of low resolution because uh, I don't have it set up to, uh, to uh, bring in the high resolution data of Mars. But we're going to come in here on uh, our little Curiosity spacecraft. Now, this is the size of like a small SUV, kind of like a... I always get surprised with how big the rovers are. For some reason in my head, they always are very, very small, but it is like the size of a small car. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. And, and of course, what's cool about uh, Curiosity is that it landed using this crazy like rocket system and things like that. And that's one of the reasons they could get this larger size rover uh, down on the Mars Martian surface. Uh, other, um, other rovers like uh, the MRO, um, Spirit and Opportunity rovers that landed in the early 2000s, those landed using this cool, like, bouncy balloon system. So they inflated balloons and then actually, like, basically crash landed onto the planet, but with this shock absorbing balloons. And, uh, and that uh, has a very serious upper limit on how large you can make uh, this spacecraft. So a lot of the rovers are pretty tiny, like, um, uh, like the uh, Spirit and Opportunity are kind of, I think of this like the size of a, um, you know, a table you might find in front of your couch or something, a pretty mm -hmm. like a small tabletop. But well, curiosity um, is... I have an interesting question here, actually, Ryan, if you want to address it about Mars. Uh, since Mars is red because of rust, was there a lot of oxygen or flowing water in its past? So those are exactly the questions that we're, we're trying to piece out. The, the, the rust uh, aspect, and actually, I was just talking to a... Um, someone who studied Mars for quite some time, and he pointed out that once you get right below this surface layer of uh, kind of rusty, um, iron-rich material, uh, it's Mars is a completely different color. It's more, he said it's more like bluish colored, uh, that this red is really just the surface level. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'd have to admit that I am not a, uh, a planetary scientist. My background is in astronomy and some stuff farther away than Mars. Uh, so I can't tell you the exact history and origin of uh, of uh, the, the rusty surface layer, um, but we'll be happy to, to address that in the comments. Uh, but the question about water in the past, um, I think is is one that uh, has received a lot of attention and I can say a little bit more about because I'm a little better informed on it. And that is that Mars absolutely had flowing water billions of years ago. And, uh, and then there's certain cases where, for example, maybe a meteorite struck the surface and, and created brief periods of flowing water more recently than that. But billions of years ago, there might have even been uh, a large ocean on Mars's surface, covering something like a third of the planet's surface. 
Uh, that is absolutely no longer the case. Mars has, has lost its, its, uh, its any kind of surface liquid water. Um, but in the past, it had a thicker atmosphere and was able to kind of hold on to that, that water. And so there were certainly lakes and possibly an ocean on Mars's surface. So what these, uh, what the rovers on Mars have gone out to look for, for the most part, is evidence of that sort of history of water, trying to piece together in these different locations on Mars what happened in the distant past. Uh, and then Curiosity actually had a much larger suite of instruments. Uh, and what's cool, and this, the reason I wanted to mention it this week, is that uh, we've. it looks like everything is nice and smooth around Curiosity here, the way we're showing it, but that's just the way we've depicted it um, based on the imagery and data that we had. In fact, uh, as you see, when you look a little farther away, there's a lot of, uh, in this case, a lot will look like little rocks, but in the distance, you can see larger sort of boulders. Uh, Curiosity has to um, navigate basically on its own. Uh, and so there's a recent citizen science project that we've announced. You uh, and we, we posted this on our Facebook page um, yesterday, so uh, Thursday. Uh, June 18th, for those of you looking at this uh, in, the, in the future. And um, you can go and you can help uh, look at images and help Curiosity identify uh, rocks and features that it would need to avoid. And so uh, it's kind of a cool citizen science project. Again, we posted about it yesterday on our Facebook page and the Morrison Planetary Facebook page. So if you get a chance to take a look at that, you can help uh, make sure that, that Curiosity can navigate safely around the Martian surface, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know who would want to help out? A little curiosity. Oh, yeah. Curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was so sad when I learned that they had curiosity sing happy birthday to itself the first year it was there, but then not ever again after that. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's like it was just too depressing. Like I did last year, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> Well, let's see. I do want to go to one other place in our solar system. So uh, I mentioned that we were kind of looking close to the sun. We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the inner planets. But let's go ahead and fly out now to get a perspective on uh, all eight of the planets in our solar system. So our inner planets, and we also have, though, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the, the outer um, uh, giant planets. Uh, in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, they're sort of what we often called gas giants. They're pretty big and mostly gaseous, not entirely. And um, and then also uh, Uranus and Neptune more like ice giants. I just wanted to go and visit um, Saturn and the Saturn system because um, it's uh, there's kind of this interesting story um, uh, that came out this past week about Saturn's moon um, Titan, which is... Uh, the largest uh, moon in orbit around Saturn, and uh, an amazing place. With actually, there were two stories about Titan. One is about uh, the possibility of finding volcanoes on its surface, which is just sort of, mm -hmm. of mind blowing. You can see that Saturn has lots of moons. The way we have it illustrated here, all of these little loop de loops around Saturn uh, are some of its minor moons. Uh, and uh, if we get closer in, however, I think that tangle of orbits disappears. Maybe not. Um, uh, but uh, I actually wanted to point out Titan. And if you give me just a moment, I'm kind of kind of doing this manually, so I just want to. Um, uh, and I feel like often people will ask about the software we're using, Ryan. So what are you? Yeah. Uh, which one are you using right now? So this is a software called uh, UniView, and it is a software that um, is really designed for planetary use. It's 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 a it's kind of what I often call like bespoke planetarium software. So unfortunately, it's not uh, software that you can, uh, can sort of download at home and use. But but we do also offer programs using what's called open space, which is open source uh, software uh, that you can download and do this kind of stuff at home. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but um, certainly something you can, uh, uh, you can do on your own. And there's also some great software called World Wide Telescope where you can do a lot of the same things. So, um, so yeah, I brought you up to the Titan to kind of show you that it is pretty uh, pretty boring when you look at it from uh, from a kind of optical light. This is actually a layer of clouds, and sort of just sort of looks like this giant tennis ball. Uh, but underneath that uh, um, uh, that thick layer of clouds, we know there's this fascinating uh, uh, the set of, uh, of again 
a little bit like maybe Mars might have looked in the past, lakes and uh, regions where uh, it's not liquid water, but it's, uh, it's a lot of like kind of uh, rich organic and kind of oily substances that form the, the lakes on, uh, uh, on Titan. What I wanted to show though, let me just go ahead and try to get rid of some of these. Uh, um, many, many orbits. <laughs> many, 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 there we go, oh, much better. Um, so, uh, so here you can see Titan with Saturn in the background. Uh, what was recently announced is that uh, Titan is actually sort of spiraling away from Saturn. Uh, and it's doing so a hundred times faster than we expected. So it's kind of this astonishing um, sort of thing. I mean, when, when we look at these orbits of, of planets around the sun or moons around planets, we think of them as kind of, you know, over the course of our lifetimes, they're not changing much. We think of them as sort of constant. But Titan out here is actually spiraling away. So it's getting farther and farther away from Saturn over time. And it's doing so really fast, or at least, you know, on, a, on astronomical terms. And this is just part of this kind of fascinating, I think, history of, uh, of these complicated planetary systems where someplace like Saturn, of course, Saturn itself has these uh, remarkable rings and a lot of questions even about the development and origin of that ring system. Uh, and then the story that, that Titan is in fact on this kind of uh, not very stable orbit spinning away from Saturn, I think it's just a pretty cool uh, recent announcement from this, this past month. Do they think it will eventually leave Saturn entirely or just kind of move away? Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Given enough time, uh, of course, yeah, it would probably just be, um, be uh, kind of migrate out of the system. But of course, then the other interesting thing is, and I didn't really point that out, but there are also orbits of, um, of other moons around Saturn. And so the, uh, the, um, uh, the gravitational effect of, of, Mar of Titan kind of barreling through uh, those moons could, could have interactions. And uh, even if Titan doesn't get kicked out, maybe it kicks another uh, moon out. That's me being hypothetical. Uh, but, uh, but still, it's, it just shows these, these systems are really complicated in terms of even just their uh, gravitational interactions. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe I should bring up, uh, as we're leaving the solar system here, the trajectories of some of our um, fastest spacecraft. Because I mentioned that, that humans have only traveled out to, um, to, the, uh, to the distance of Earth's moon, which is way, way down here, very, um, very much lost in the glow down in the center of our image here. Uh, but the trajectory of these five spacecraft actually show the five fastest spacecraft that we've launched out into space. Um, I showed you Curiosity uh, that's landed on the surface of Mars. We've had uh, spacecraft that have visited both Jupiter and Saturn and orbited those planets and explored the, the planets and their moons. Uh, but these five spacecraft are the five that had been launched with enough uh, or and eventually gained enough velocity that they will escape the Earth's, uh, the sun's gravity altogether. So you were asking about um, Titan kind of leaving the uh, the Saturn system. Well, this is an example of, of the these sort of five fastest like nuts and bolts objects that we've sent out into the universe and they have basically only gotten to uh, a distance that in terms of light travel time, the fastest thing that we uh, know of, uh, have traveled less than light travels in a single day. And so now as I kind of transition out of the solar system, we're gonna go from talking about observations that have been made by basically sending spacecraft to visit places uh, and talk about observations that have been made uh, using light, studying light from distant distant objects. And since this is sort of a shortened universe update, um, I won't do all of the, the kind of discussion of, of uh, travel time and things like that that I normally do, but we're going to leave the sun behind and actually we're going to reveal that we've been lying to you, that the sun is actually much brighter uh, than... Uh, How do you? <laughs> well, yeah. Lying in a, in a uh, constructive way. Uh, no good way to go with that. Anyway, the, uh, but now the, the sun is, is illustrated the same brightness of all of the other stars in uh, our database. And now as we pull even farther and farther away, we've traveled light years from home at this point. And, uh, and so now that the stars we're beginning to see not in their kind of familiar constellation shapes, but rather in this sort of three dimensional distribution of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. You can kind of see the faint band of the Milky Way here in the background. 
uh, from Earth, the Milky Way appears as, um, well, as the name suggests, if you're um, hip to uh, Greek mythology, um, the Milky Way is it's supposed to be a band of milk uh, in, in, the, uh, in the sky. Uh, it was a story that comes from Greek mythology, and actually the word Greek word for milk is related to the word galaxy in English. So we call these galaxies uh, because of the Milky Way uh, uh, kind of influencing our terminology. But whereas the Milky Way appears as sort of this band that runs through our sky from our perspective inside uh, the Milky Way, it's actually this collection of hundreds of billions of stars in sort of this uh, spiral kind of disc shaped. So we're looking at it kind of face on here, but we're gonna let it sort of rotate around for a little bit. And I wanna tell you about some really exciting uh, observations that were made uh, just this past year. And in fact, because I kind of lucked out here, I'll just point out that our galaxy isn't alone. We also have the small and large Magellanic clouds. Uh, they're not this flat. We're just kind of pre presenting their images on little planes to represent where they're uh, located. Uh, but the Milky Way itself uh, is about 100,000 light years from side to side, give or take. And that means that it would take 100,000 years for light to travel from one side to the other. Now, for comparison, our, our nearest star is only about four light years away. Uh, and actually here in the distance, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy. It's a little exaggerated in size, but uh, or brightness, uh, but you can see that. And then the other dots that you see off in the distance are actually not stars anymore. These are individual galaxies. So every one of these little color-coded points represents an individual galaxy. But going back to the Milky Way, the Milky Way is, again, about 100,000 light years across. And you've probably heard the stories that there is a, a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Now, it turns out it's not the most impressive supermassive black hole. I mean, it's a supermassive black hole, so it's impressive kind of by definition. But um, it has been, it's not very active now, but it has been more active in the past. And about 10 years ago, we discovered um, that what we've, uh, they were discovered by the, the Fermi um, spacecraft. So we called them the Fermi bubbles. Uh, and this is just sort of a representation uh, that we have of the Fermi bubbles. And they're basically kind of giant lobes of gas that have been ejected, basically like a giant burp from the, uh, from the supermassive black hole when it adjusted, something happened billions, or, uh, millions of years ago at the center of the galaxy. And this gas was ejected out of the, uh, plane of the Milky Way. Now, these were discovered in uh, intense sort of X-ray radiation, so wavelengths that are highly energetic and uh, impossible for us to see with our eyes. But um, the, uh, uh, the kind of the, the structure of these was, was better understood when we went back uh, and looked at, um, looked basically through them at distant quasars. So I'll actually show you some quasars a little bit later. But these are just are going to represent like lines of sight. So Earth is over here, our telescopes are here. And we can observe these, basically they're, they're like giant, very bright light bulbs distant in the distant universe. We can observe uh, some just outside the, the bubbles and some uh, uh, looking right through the, the bubbles. And, um, and by teasing out different wavelengths of light, we could understand that these bubbles were expanding. And the reason that I can say that about three and a half billion years ago, oh, sorry, three and a half million years ago, hang on, billions of stars, millions of years can get a little tongue twisting sometimes, um, is because we could look through um, this gas and by making observations of these distant objects that are, that are billions of light years away, we could see that uh, um, let me get around to a side view here, that one side of the uh, Fermi bubbles was, was moving toward us. And, uh, and that's seen as a shift in the wavelengths of the light toward the blue end of the spectrum. So we color color coded that blue. The other side of the, the Fermi bubbles are moving away from us. Uh, and so that appears as a red shift, uh, as a shift in the wavelength of light from to the redder end of the spectrum. And so we color coded that red. But we basically were looking at absorption from the gas uh, in these bubbles. And that was a result that came out a couple of years ago. Just this past month at the meeting of the American Astronomical Society, um, a group from Wisconsin announced that they've made direct observations of uh, the gas on the leading side, so on the side that's moving toward us. And so that's 
that's great because that means that we can begin to, to map out the Fermi bubbles with much greater precision. If you can imagine, if we could only observe like using these little lines of sight out to the distant objects, we can only understand you know, what's happening like here or here and here. Um, whereas being able to make an actual observation of this, uh, of the whole like mass of uh, gas that's moving toward us, we're going to be able to understand the, the structure and the history of these, uh, of these kind of cool Fermi bubbles um, in even greater detail. So that's kind of a cool observation that was announced uh, just earlier this month at the American Astronomical Society meeting. And in a similar announcement, a related announcement, uh, remember the large and small Magellanic clouds I mentioned earlier, um, we actually know that these um, are not just sitting in their places, kind of like, uh, you know, Titan orbits Saturn or Earth orbits the Sun. Uh, here we know that, that the large and small Magellanic clouds sort of effectively orbit uh, the larger Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and this kind of um, uh, sort of tenuous kind of illustration I put up here is uh, what's called the Magellanic Stream. And so if you can imagine as the um, as these two little galaxies orbit the Milky Way, they leave behind a kind of trail of gas. And this Magellanic Stream, as it's called, is a, a source of uh, lots of great interest for all kinds of reasons, because it is sort of, although we've drawn it very tenuously here, it's actually the, the densest kind of collection of, of, of gas uh, in the uh, in intergalactic space that's nearby. Uh, so it's an, a fascinating thing to study in terms of looking for uh, objects that are potentially even forming in this, uh, in this region. But uh, what's interesting this month is that we've actually seen reflections of light off of the uh, uh, off of the Magellanic Stream from that event about three and a half billion million years ago. I'm just gonna keep making that mistake, aren't I? So three and a half million years ago, an event that uh, created these Fermi bubbles, these giant expanding bubbles of gas, also illuminated part of the Magellanic Stream. Uh, this gas that's sort of that's trailing the orbits of uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, uh, and astronomers were actually able to observe that. Uh, with the uh, with the results announced just in the last uh, uh, in the last month, is there a reason they only just recently were able to observe these? Like, is there an update in the soft like the telescopes we've been using, or have they just been looking in different places? That's a great question. Uh, the Magellan Extreme itself is has only been known for a uh, 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 less than a decade. I want to say maybe a little more than a decade. Oh, wow. um, but it's a relatively recent discovery because it's it's hard to tease out uh, where this gas is relative to everything in the background. Um, uh, so I'm not I'm not sure whether they were specifically looking for the effect of this or whether they were making observations of the Magellan Extreme and it revealed uh, something that they could then associate with this event from uh, that occurred about three and a half million years ago. So that's a great question. Uh, and one that uh, I'd have to go back and look at the original research paper for. Cool. So I don't know if I have time. Should we uh, go ahead and just take a quick trip out to the? Uh, yeah, we can go out real quick, I think. Oh, I did promise that I would show Quasar, so I have to do it. Okay. I always like doing this, and uh, sometimes I'm told that it's don't have to do it in every show, but I like doing it in every show. So uh, I'll point out that off here in the distance, you see this collection of like red dots. That's actually a cluster of galaxies called the um, the Virgo cluster. Let me just go ahead and get rid of our Fermi bubbles and our uh, Magellan extreme here. Uh, and we'll just leave our Milky Way galaxy behind. And as we do, uh, you'll see that, um, I think what's very important to note here is that galaxies aren't just sort of uniformly distributed in space. Uh, so that Virgo cluster of galaxies. It's color coded red because the astronomer who put these data sets together color coded it red because he's trying to understand the relationships between all these different galaxies. Um, but notice that galaxies are kind of clumped and clustered together. The regions where there are lots of galaxies, like the Virgo cluster, uh, and regions where there just aren't so many galaxies. And this is a this is a fascinating kind of uh, glimpse into sort of the history of how our universe has taken shape uh, because uh, it shows that, that very early on 
there was some kind of structure in the universe that led to this sort of clumping and clustering of galaxies uh, that we uh, that we see today. I've now pulled far enough away that um, we're seeing uh, a fairly complete collection of about thirty thousand galaxies close to home, and in addition, we're we're showing um, surveys that have gone very very deep, looking very very far away to understand where, how galaxies are distributed. And in fact, the, the, the dots that are, we're showcasing here at the greatest distances are in fact not even individual galaxies, but the bright cores of young galaxies. And I just want to point out that the, region, the reason we see almost no galaxies here or here in the upper right or lower left of this image is not because there aren't galaxies there, but because the uh, the surveys didn't cover that part of the sky. So seen from Earth, these parts of the sky were not covered by the telescopes that made the observations. And uh, and, I, and so now these distant points that are showing are actually quasars. So remember I said that the Fermi bubbles were characterized by observing distant quasars through that expanding gas. These are the kinds of objects uh, that, uh, that we studied uh, Schoenberg studied in order to understand the expansion and the changes that are happening relatively close to home. So these are like kind of giant beacons that are visible at great, great distances uh, because they are the very bright young cores of galaxies uh, that, uh, that existed early in the history of the universe. And that kind of underscores an important point, which is that as we look out into space, we look back into time. So these dots that, that we're seeing actually existed very, very far back in time, billions of years ago, uh, because the universe was a sort of different place then, and young galaxies were a lot more active, were creating a lot more stars in the centers of those galaxies, were able to fuel uh, basically these giant black holes at their centers, much more active and interesting than the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, which create basically beacons that we can see across the universe. And the punchline to this kind of story of how looking out into space is looking back into time is the kind of mottled image that I've faded up in the background here. So even farther away than all of these distant galaxies or these distant quasars, we see what's called the cosmic microwave background. And this isn't an image like uh, a typical image. It's more like a heat map. And we've kind of cranked up the contrast on this image. So if we looked out at this distance, we see a we see a very uniform glow uh, from basically when the universe was a lot smaller, a lot hotter. That's a little counterintuitive because we're talking about this being the most distant light. But bear with me for a moment. But when we turn up the contrast, we notice that there's a little bit of variation in that that overall heat. Some of the spots are a little hotter. We color coded those brighter. Some are cooler. We color coded them darker. And it turns out that the amount of stuff is related to that as well. So the bright pot spots are a little more diffuse, whereas the dark, dark spots are more dense and clumped together. And we think that variation from the sort of denser parts to the less dense parts are what eventually led to the formation of the clusters of galaxies that we see close to home, like the Virgo cluster that I pointed out. And so this ancient sort of baby picture of the universe actually tells us uh, the very first steps of that formation of structure uh, in the universe close to home. So it's kind of cool to get that perspective uh, before heading back home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just, uh, again, the sort of counterintuitive thing is that, you know, first of all, um, we're sh what we're showing in this baby picture of early in the universe when the universe was actually much smaller is very far away from us. And that's just because, again, as we look out into space, we're looking back in time. So this image that I'm showing, this three-dimensional map, is really a map that's 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 human-centered because it's our perspective on the universe around us. And that is why we end up at the center of the image. It's not because we're the center of the universe, it's just because we're the ones who are drawing the map. Despite what some may think. Exactly. <laughs> I know some people who think they're the center of the universe, but in fact, they are not, and we are not. So with that, let me go ahead and kind of bring us close to home. If we have any other questions, uh, I'm happy to make stops on the way. 
Um, but we'll go ahead and kind of fade down our baby picture of the universe. We'll uh, fly back to those quasars and the distant galaxies. Through those color-coded galaxies that are assembled by an astronomer looking for patterns of structure in the nearby universe. Back in toward our Milky Way galaxy. A collection of hundreds of billions of stars into the hundreds of thousands of stars closest to us. And it's kind of cool. You can see the Pleiades off in the distance. And the Hyades, base of Taurus, the bull. And, uh, and that's that's how you can tell we're close to home because the constellations start to resume their familiar shapes. We'll come in almost exactly on the plane of the solar system here, which is a little weird, but okay. Um, <laughs> random. And uh, and then we'll come into the third rock from the sun, our own home planet, Earth. Yay, we're back home. <laughs> and we can see the orbit of the International Space Station there, which of course is where we, we started this whole journey. And just as an aside, notice it is on the nighttime side of Earth once again, because uh, it orbits about every 90 minutes. And I didn't talk for a full 90 minutes, so it's not all the way around Earth. I only talked for about a third of that. So. All right, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, if anybody fun. has any questions, feel free to put them in the comment box. And I was thinking as we were flying back in, everyone, once we are back in the building at the Academy of Sciences, people should definitely come and see this in the planetarium because that fly back in the planetarium is such a fun experience. Yeah, it's a little nicer when it's all around you and sort of, yeah. yeah. But someday we'll be back. In the meantime, it's great to share all this with, uh, with everyone on Facebook. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we can answer them later. Uh, otherwise, have a great Juneteenth and a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Have a wonderful day. Take care.